Good morning, everyone. Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you for this morning. It's uh, great to be together. We're so thankful for all the moms and just getting to celebrate them. And God, it's always just so encouraging to give honor uh, to those who honor is due. And uh, we just thank you so much, God, for our moms. And we especially thank you for, God, you and who you are and how you just take care of us and love us. God, you truly have the love of a mom and a dad, and uh, we're just so uh, so thankful that uh, you love us the way you do and bless us the way you do. We pray for this time as we get into your word that we could be moved and encouraged and inspired uh, just to uh, really go out there and be lights in this world. We love you, praise you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So special shout out to uh, my mom, Ruth Touche, and a special shout out to my stepmother as well, Kathy Touche, and... Yeah. My mother-in-law, Diane Hirsch. So, but last but not least, and everybody's like, "Well, what about Rachel?" I know what you're saying. I gave us, I saved the best for last. So, um, I definitely give a shout out to my wife, Rachel. She is a great mom to our three girls. And uh, man, you know, I think about, uh, I think about my mom, and I mean, God bless her. You know, God bless my mom. Um, she had to put up with me and my brother, and I tell you what. We were terrors, man. Um, you know, she, my mom had to, my parents divorced uh, when I was 14, and, and uh, my mom had to raise us on her own, you know, and it uh, uh, wouldn't have been so bad, you know, during the school year, it was okay, because she was working a job and you know, going to school, but during the summers, man, that's when the terrors, uh, that's when we took hold. It's amazing that we have any furniture that was still freestanding, because we would turn our living room into a sports arena. Uh, we had Nerf baseball in there. You know, we'd have the little Nerf ball, and we'd smack it with our hands and try to hit home runs over taped-up walls that we made on the, on the wall. We had a basketball hoop that we put in there that we'd play on, and, you know, we'd hit the ball off the tables and off the lamps, and we weren't smart enough to move everything out of the way. We just left it as is, you know. And, and then we would have, you know, my favorite thing for us to do was WWF wrestling, you know. We would jump off the couches onto each other and you know it was tough man and my mom god bless her she'd come home and that inevitably something would be broken and all the food that she had bought would be eaten and she'd come home and you could just see her her thing i hope she's watching this because she'll laugh but uh, her thing was you could tell when she was getting mad she'd go <sighs> and you could just tell it was like okay i've got to blow this out or i'm gonna blow up you know we saw that coming, we were like, it's over, man, we better, you know, run for cover, but, uh, you know, with my mom, you could tell what she just wanted more than anything was obedience. She's like, man, if my kids were just obedient, it would be great, and what's funny is now I see that being the theme in our household also, you know, <laughs> It's like my mom, would, it, it's funny when I call my mom and I lament about my kids in some sort of way, she just goes, <laughs> <laughs> like, what's that evil laugh, you know, she's going to, goes around, comes around, you know, I'm like, oh, she's right, you know, but uh, it's that obedience, you know, I know that's the thing that, man, parents just want, because when your kids obey, what's it make you, it makes you feel loved, when they obey, when they do it, especially when they do it the first time. That's so cool, isn't it, parents? When your kids do something the first time, you say, hey, go pick up your coat. They just walk over and do it, and they, hey, you're like, wow, this is great, you know. I feel so loved. I feel so, I'm going to cry. This is emotional, you know. It's so good. That's what we want. And it's so amazing when you think about God with us, how much he just wants how much he wants obedience, you know, how really our obedience really proves our faith in a lot of ways. You know, there's some, uh, there's an awesome, a couple awesome scriptures here in Hebrews chapter 11, and I just want to set up here, we're going to have a couple of, I'm going to talk about this kind of faithful obedience here the next couple of weeks, but uh, I wanted to use Abraham to set this up, because Abraham, you know, he's He's considered the father of faith, right? He's the kind of the first faithful example we have in the Bible. He's this guy that, man, what an awesome guy, right? Hebrews 11, 8 and 9, it says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. 
And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to the land, went to live in the land of the promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. You go down a little bit further there in Hebrews, and it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said through Isaac, shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. You know, see these two great examples of Abraham, who's considered to be the father of faith, and what do we see? It's him obeying God. That's what proved his faith. It was this obedience. He did what God said. God said, go. He didn't know where he's going, but he just went. Could you imagine that? Hey, Neil, I want you to go. What's the first question you're going to ask? Where? Where? But he didn't. He just went, okay. You know, I don't know if he walked out the door and just was like, well, I guess I'll just go right or go left or straight or whatever. He probably just, just went. What a great heart, right? And then even more so later... He's like, God says, hey, you're going to sacrifice your son, whom he had told him some years earlier, this is going to be, your offspring are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sands in the seashore, right? And it's going to come through Isaac. But now I want you to go sacrifice him. Crazy, right? But what's he do? He does it. And at the last second he gets stopped, right? But he did it. There was this obedience, this faithful obedience. And I want to talk about that here this week and next with a two-part series here. And we're going to, uh, the title of it is, When a Little Means a Lot. You turn your Bibles, if you would, to, uh, we're going to look over here in Luke chapter 4. You know, Jesus, as he started, was kind of starting off his ministry and he's beginning to assert his kind of his ministerial, you know, leadership. He's, he's been, you know, scholars think he's approximately 30 years old at this point, and he's starting his ministry. And, you know, it says here in Luke 4, uh, 20, or, well, shortly before this here, Jesus walks into the synagogue, as was his custom. You know, he'd go into the synagogue and teach, and he unrolls the scroll, and he reads from Isaiah. And he reads this incredible scripture, you know, this part, and he says, man, He talks about setting the captives free. He he talks about this whole thing, this liberation, this Messiah. And he is saying, this is me. This is is me right here. You can imagine how controversial that was, right? What would it be like if I got up here and read a scripture and said, this is me? You all be like, you're crazy. I'm sure that's how they felt about Jesus. And in fact, they started questioning him a little bit, right? And that's where we kind of pick it up here. In verse 22 of Luke 4, it says, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, as he could read their hearts, right? Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zephyrath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff. But because Jesus is awesome, but passing through their midst, he went away. (laughs) Jesus is so awesome. He's like a man's man, you know, he's like, no, it's not my time. I'm just walking through here, and you're going to move. And they did, and he walked off, right? But what's so amazing here is that Jesus reads this. 
he reads this scroll, and they're all kind of amazed at what he says. But then he says, listen, you guys, you're not doing, living, having the heart that you're supposed to have. You're supposed to be faithfully obedient, and you're not. And he goes on, and as Jesus does several different times in the Gospels, he uses two people, and these are the two people we're going to talk about these next two weeks. He uses two people that are not Jews to make his point. Number one, he uses this widow, and we're going to talk about her today. But he says this widow, she's not Jewish, she's not even a believer. But man, that's where God sent Elijah to get fed. So what's that say about you? Then he goes on and says, hey, then he went to Naaman, Elijah, and here were a bunch of lepers around, but they chose Naaman. Naaman, not a Jew. Whoa. <laughs> they were, they, it made them so mad, they said, we're going to throw you off a cliff. <laughs> they were felt affronted, but really what it was was Jesus was challenging their hearts. And I think how this applies to us today is that in many ways, because we claim Jesus, a lot of times we can become like these Jews. Is that we get kind of this religious comfortability about us. Well, we're the believers and, you know, we're, we're special. We are in God's sight. But sometimes that pride can get a little too much, right? Right? We can get a little too comfortable. And God says, hey, man, it's all about faithful obedience still. Just because you claim Jesus doesn't mean you don't still have to obey Jesus. Amen? Seems like, yeah, that's right. But I want you to ask yourself these next two weeks. I want you to check, check yourself, evaluate yourself. Am I obeying Jesus? You know, we walk into here, look over in 1 Kings chapter 17, because we're going to look at this part here. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about this widow, this mom that was in, man, this mom was in some dire straits here. And it's, man, this story in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 17 is incredible because before he even meets the widow, God says, I want you to go basically tell Ahab what's up. And not only that, but it's your hometown. You're going to go into your hometown. You're going to tell Ahab that, hey, it's about, we're about to have a drought and a famine. And you have to understand, it's funny, sometimes Scripture downplays things a little bit because it's not necessarily the point that they're trying to get to, but could you imagine doing that? <laughs> could you imagine walking in the most powerful guy in that area and saying, look here, God's about to discipline everybody. God's about to do something. That automatically makes you public enemy number one. It's like, and it wasn't like, you know, yeah, you could get thrown in prison, but most likely they were going to chop your head off or something. It was going to be brutal, right? So he says, Elijah, I want you to do this. So Elijah goes, he talks to Ahab, and, and then he's like, <laughs> then God says, hey, I'm going to go hide you now for a while. And I want you to go find this brook, and you're going to stay by this brook, and I'm going to feed you by ravens. Hey, great plan, right? Sure. Sounds awesome. You're going to send me there and I'm going to feed the ravens. No, I'm going to send you there and the ravens are going to feed you. Okay. <laughs> Have any of you ever been fed by a bird before? Could you imagine that being the only way you're going to get food? <laughs> ravens are a little creepy to me anyway, if you've ever seen a raven. And there's all these different, you know, what, who was it, Edgar Allan Poe that did the raven sort of, you know. Those birds scare me, but those are going to be the ones that are going to bring your food every day. Elijah's awesome because he doesn't question it. I'm sorry, I would have had a hard time with this one. 
I would have had to pray a little bit. Okay, amen. Um, all right. So he goes, and it happens. And every day these ravens come and drop off food, which would have been a little disgusting, to be honest. It's coming out of their little mouths. It's gross. But hey, it was probably good because it came from God, right? And I feel like God was teaching a little lesson here, and this is a little bit of a side point for us. God's provision is enough. You know, I know we can get so worried about, you know, job situation, bill situation, kid situation, school situation, whatever it is. And we forget that God's provision is enough. He tells us, even he took some time in the Gospels, right, to write down in Matthew 6, 25 through 33. Hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's like, I got you. And this is a good reminder when it comes to faithful obedience. Because there's going to be times when God asks us, calls us to do things, and it's going to feel like we're stepping out a little bit. And it's going to feel like things may not work out right. Or it's going to feel scary. It's going to feel like, is it all going to work out? And God's always got us when we're acting by faith. When we're doing things for Him, when we're putting Him first, He's always got you every time. It's a promise. This isn't prosperity gospel I'm preaching. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong. What I'm talking about is when you step out by faith, God will get you. He's not going to give you a million dollars, but He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. Don't let that fear or that worry keep you from faithfully obeying. But then we jump in here. Look at verse 8 here. This is when he goes to meet the widow, and it was like God was using this time to prepare him. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. Okay. All right. This is a little better. Honestly, the widow can probably throw down a little bit, okay? This is better than ravens. But still, this is interesting, right? So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going, as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. It's interesting, God chooses the most unlikely of people to work through. A non-Jewish widow who is as broke as you can be. And Elijah is being called to rely on God's provision in a deep and challenging way, but he comes through faithfully without question. But who I really want to focus on here, even though we can learn from Elijah's faith, is this widow. Because her story is super relatable to us. As it picks up here, verse 12, and she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. The widow didn't have much to give at all. As a matter of fact, she was going to make her last meal. She was so, you, could, you can sense from what it says there, just the, the discouragement, the resign. You know, I'm going to make this last meal that we may eat it and die because this is it. We've got nothing else. We're done. Now, 
I think it's interesting here. She says, as the Lord your God lives. There's a little bit, a little tiny bit of faith there. Little bit. And you know what's amazing is, even though this woman has very little, she goes and does what Elisha asked her to do. That little bit, she goes and does it. Have you ever felt desperate like that? Have you ever been in a scenario where you felt like, I don't know what else to do? Have you ever felt like you were in a situation where this feels like this is it? (laughs) Where you're just so discouraged, so frustrated that you just thought, man, I don't know what I can do. And I think as those times are extended, they really seem to be the worst of the worst. But could it be? Here's something I want you to consider today. Could it be that at the times we have the least, that's when we are at our best for God? Could it be that the times when we have the least... When we feel we're at our least, that that's when we are at our best for God. You don't have to turn there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, but, we, but, he said to, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. You know, it's tempting to think of our strength as something special. We talk about our strengths with pride and our weaknesses with disdain. But in God's upside-down kingdom, could it be that our times of little is when God moves the most? That when we bring just our little bit to the table, that that's when God moves the most. That when just our mustard seed of faith, Jesus says, can move a mountain. That when we are at our weakest, that's when God moves the most. That amazing things, as we'll see, happened with this widow... When she had very little, but she brought her little bit to the table. And look what God does. He does that with us all the time. You may feel like, I don't have much faith. You may feel like, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how we're going to get through this situation. I don't know how I'm going to get through this sin. I don't know how I'm going to repent of this. I don't know I'm going to move forward here. I don't know how my relationship is going to get better with my spouse. I don't know how I'm going to raise my kids through all these challenges. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But guess what? Bring your little bit. Bring your little bit to the table and watch what God does. Because when you're weak, that's when you're strong. When you're at your weakest, that's when God works the most. That's when His power, it says, is made perfect or complete is when you're at your weakest. We can come up to God and say, I got this. And that's typically what we do. We don't say it, but that's how we are when we don't pray. When we don't get into our Bible. When we don't submit ourselves to discipling one another. That's what we're doing. Oh, I got this. And guess what? Is it a surprise that God doesn't work in those situations? But it's when you're desperate, when you just lay out and say, you know what, I need help. That's when God moves. When you bring your little tiny bit. Remember the widow with the two copper coins? Jesus looks and goes, that's what it's all about. Because that was all she had. But she brought it to the table. That's how God loves to work. Going on here in verse 17. By the way, that's... uh, The one on the left, there's Neil. The other one's Ben. Um, I'm not on there because I couldn't fit. Um, So, first, (laughs) it's because I love those guys. 
been smarter than Neil, though. Uh, first King 17. <laughs> for the, for the, you guys know I love them. Right, Neil? Are we still friends? Oh, no. It's over. Forgive us, Lord, forgave you. Anyway, 1 Kings 17. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent. Remember, she brought that little bit, right? And this is God speaking through Elijah. The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. That faithful obedience, right? God speaking through Elijah, and he says, Hey, go give me some food. And she does what the Lord says, and what happens? It just keeps on going. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. A miracle, an unending jar of flour, an unending jug of oil, God's mega blessing for the, little, the widow's little step. <laughs> All she did was what God said to do. You know, sometimes we think, you know, it, it, it just shows how amazing God is. Sometimes we think if we just do what we're supposed to do, then amen, right? The way God is, is he doesn't just, when you do what you're supposed to do, he doesn't just go, hey, awesome. He blesses it. You know, and sometimes incredibly I mean, look at this, unending food for a lady that was going to die. Just for her doing, it wasn't like she all of a sudden said, God is my God, and now I'm a believer, and blah, blah, blah. She didn't say that. She just, I'm going to do what he said. And boom. Incredible, huh? Guys and gals, God is calling He's calling for our obedience. He's asking us to feed the prophet metaphorically. I want you to think about this question long and hard today. Write this down. What faith step is God asking you to take today? What faith step is he asking you to take today? There's an alarm going off somewhere. What faith step is God asking you to take today? What, it, what could it be? Is it to share your faith with a coworker, neighbor, or fellow student? Is it to finally confess that sin that has been buried for far too long? Is it to engage in that difficult conversation that's long overdue? Is it to come finally to commit yourself to a relationship with God that is real, honest, open, and dynamic? What is it? What is it for you today? What is it that God is putting on your heart right now that's in your mind that, man, that's the step i got to take? Some of you, it might be for the first time to actually sit down and study the Bible. Some of you, it may be, I just need to, I need to step out of a certain situation that I'm in that's been bad, and I just need to step out of it. And I need to get some help. Maybe some of you, there's some kind of sin that's been on your heart for a long time. And you're like, I just need to confess. I need to get, at, I need to get it out of me. Some of you, it may be just to commit yourself that you've been sitting there for a while, stewing, wrestling. And now it's time to just say, you know what? I got, it's time to go for it spiritually. And I'm telling you guys, Whatever it is that God's asking you to do, just bring your little bit to the table. Just bring your little bit. The way God works is He waits for you to make that step, right? And then He comes rushing in. Love the story. One of my favorite parables in the Bible is the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, man, that dude, (laughs) you know, this kid, man, his dad's an awesome dad because it's God. 
And he's awesome. And he goes out and he says, you know what? I want my inheritance, which was as about as insulting as you could be. You didn't get your inheritance until your dad died. He says, I want my inheritance. And the dad gives it to him and he goes. And guess what the dad does, though? He waits. And as soon as he sees that head pop over the horizon, what's he do? Does he wait for him to come? He takes off running to go meet him. That's God's heart for us. You take that little step and God comes rushing in. That little bit you bring to the table, just bring it. Come sit at the table and say, God, this is all I got. I, I, I don't know how to get past this, but God, this is all I got. And watch what he does. He proved it here through the widow. Man, I think about the feeding of the 5,000. Or Jesus' first miracle when he makes the wa- turns the water into wine. Did Jesus need the water jugs to make wine? Did Jesus need five loaves and two fish to feed the 5,000? Did Jesus need that? No, he doesn't. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants to do it, but he always wants us to bring something to the table because he wants us to be a part of the miracle. He wants us to be a part of it. He wants you to join in with it. He says he's, we're co-workers. He wants us to work together. I don't know why. It seems like a bad plan to me. I don't know why he would choose me to be a co-worker of his. But he does, and that's plan A, and that's the only plan. There is no plan B. It's us working together and just bring your little bit because he wants to use it to do something great. It's just like if somebody gave you a car. Hey, awesome, right? But if you have to work for that car, if you have to bring something to the table, it's a little bit more special. God wants you, man, to bring something to the table. He wants you to be a part of the miracle. Verse 17 After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Hey, everything was great there for a minute, wasn't it? I relate to this so much. God does something amazing, but even though we try not to, something bad comes our way and we throw the faith right out the door. (laughs) She should have been pretty grateful for Elijah for keeping her from dying, right? Now she's like, why have you come? You've come to bring calamity because things got bad again, as they inevitably will. And it gets thrown out the door. You know, I thought of... (laughs) This is a funny story. Well, for me, it's funny. You guys probably won't be very funny to you. But I remember when we first moved in this, this little building here, you know. Yeah, it's not the greatest building, you know. It's got its warts. But I tell you what, if you remember where we, li- where we had church services before this, you would think this is a palace. All right. The little wedding chapel over on 59th and Santa Fe. I always call it the behind the scenes, the funeral chapel. <laughs> No windows. I'm five foot nine, and I could touch the drop ceiling without having to jump. I mean, it was terrible, right? The little white, little white uh, um, pews, you know, and the posts that were all over the place, and our poor kids, you know, having to be put in little cages, basically these gates around them because it was one big room. I mean, it was something else. And man, when I first moved here, I was like, we got to change this, and we got to find something. And we prayed, and I remember John McMahon calling me one day, bro, I've got a place. And we come over here, and as soon as I saw it, I'm like, this is it, right? So we got this money that we had saved, and, and we put it into here, and Dan and his crew did a great job, and a bunch of us did a bunch of work. And we got in here, and shortly after we moved in, three consecutive weeks, I had couples that were significant givers in our church come up to me and tell me they were moving. <laughs> God, what calamity have you brought on 
this. That's exactly how I felt. I was like, wow, we just extended ourselves to move into this building. How are we going to pay for it now? So we called up Frito, and he had a bunch of money and wrote us a check. No, he's kidding. He's like, heck no. <laughs> and that's exactly how I personally felt. I was like, this is not good. <laughs> I mean, it was like week after week, and like, we're moving, we're moving. I'm like, this is not, we only got like 65 people. How low can we go, you know? But, of course, not too long later, the Borlands come. They bring their troops, you know, and all these different people moved in. And it was fine, and God worked, and God's continued to work. And the church is given, and we've been able to stay here, and it's been awesome. It was a reminder of that, man, it, things might seem like curses, but God's always got us. Yeah. And you bring your little bit to the table. We stepped out. We're like, man, we can't meet this place anymore. we got to get somewhere a little bigger. God worked. God always works. And look at this. This is so awesome. 19, and he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his bed. And he cried out to the Lord, oh, Lord, God. <laughs> you can tell Elijah's feeling a little bit too. Have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Even Elijah felt a little bit discouraged here, right? But guess what Elijah did? He brought his little to the table, didn't he? I'm going to do something. <laughs> Give me your son. I don't know if he had the plan in his mind. It doesn't sound like it. It's not like, I just got to do something here. But he takes him upstairs. And listen to this. Then he stretched himself out upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, let... This child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the children came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now, now I know you're a man of God. And the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. What an incredible miracle. The boy is raised. What a story. The widow goes from unbelieving and destitute to believing and blessed. She brought her little bit to the table, and God moved big time. What did this widow do, this mom that we're celebrating today? What did she do? Really relatively little things, but it was faithful obedience that changed her life. It was faithful obedience that when it was all said and done, changed her life. Right. Had she never did what Elijah said to do and just said, you know what, no, instead I'm just going to go and fix my food and die, they would have been dead. And Elijah would have had to move on. But instead, she gets to witness this incredible miracle. She gets to see two incredible miracles. And be a part of them. And have her faith in God instilled within her. God became her God. And her son was raised from the dead. What would happen if we all brought our little bit to the table? Think about this. God always asks every week, right? We give... A tithe. <laughs> it's a little bit, but what has God done? He talks about bring your mustard seed of faith. And how many times have we done that and it's actually seen people turn from their sins? Think about those times when you brought your little invitation to somebody. And they came to church and they studied the Bible. And they became Christians. Think about these times when we've given a relatively little bit for special missions. In the grand scheme of things, 10 times, is not, it's a lot for us, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much. But you know there are people that are being saved all over Eurasia because of the money that we've given over the years. Your little bit has meant the souls of people being saved. 
Every time we bring a little bit to the table, God does incredible things. Your small little text message with words of encouragement lifts someone's spirits. Your word of, of truth in somebody's life changes the course of their destiny. I was sharing this the other night with some of the brothers is that, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was feeling pretty down. Ben opened up his Bible, read me a little scripture. And man, I've been, every day I've been waking up, that scripture's on my heart. It has, cha- it has literally changed the course of where I was going. Just one person saying, I'm going to share this scripture. Little things. You bring your little bit to the table, watch what God will do. It doesn't take a lot. <laughs> and you may not feel like you have much to give, but bring your little bit to the table. Watch what God does because a little And God's hands means a lot. Amen? Amen. Happy Mother's Day.